Um, and our first paper today uh, is by Lydia Gare. Lydia is professor of philosophy at Columbia University. Her work on Hegel and other German thinkers covers a truly remarkable range of both breadth and depth and includes books entitled The Imaginary Museum of Musical Works, an essay in the philosophy of music, The Quest for Voice, Music, Politics, and the Limits of Philosophy, Elective Affinities, Musical Essays on the History of Aesthetic Theory, and as she mentions in her paper, a new book entitled Red Sea, Red Square, Red Thread, A Philosophical Detective Story. And her paper today is entitled Mind Your P's and Q's, Thinking Through Hegel on Provisionality and Qualification. So Lydia, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I believe I'm the only one who didn't enjoy lunch, um, <laughs> being curtailed and I having to not eat in order to stay awake. Can you hear me okay? It's good? Okay. Um, I'm going to read for a bit um, and see what happens. So my title is drawn from William James's Some Problems of Philosophy when he's addressing Hegel, which was very nice to find that mind your P's and Q's, that my subtitle attaches the letters P and Q to two terms drawn from Pinkard's conclusion to sociality of reason. I'm very grateful to Terry um, not least for blurbing my new book and having to wade through a very long book. Um, but um, it's been a great privilege to read his work. Pinkard surmises that the Hegelian resolution to modernity's problem is and even must be provisional and qualified. To so speak of the problem and its resolution is for Pinkard to engage the sense of an ending that so preoccupied Hegel when pursuing the absolute, Hegel articulated the terms of reason's place, achievement and role in a theory committed to freedom and right. Pinkard introduces the terms of provisionality and qualification to counter any tendency to find in Hegel's arrival at the modernist moment a hard or final result. This would be a result that left reasoning pretty much with nothing more to do given the claimed identity of the what is of the current state with what is right. Um, later, we call that totalitarianism. Today, if nor, not already in the 1990s, the counter proposals to Hegel's right readings, right in political terms, are no longer counter, but mainstream. They carry the strains of a post hegelian pragmatism and critical theory to discredit the authoritarian tendency in the Hegelian world picture in favor of a regard of what is provisional and qualified in the social or political organization of rights in the modern state. But is the regard toward the provisional and qualified itself provisional and qualified? Beginning with Pinkard's take on the P's and Q's in Hegel's social theory, I then survey a broader scholarship on the P's and Q's of endings, beginnings, and everything in between. I draw out the potential confusions when Hegel's terms are transmitted through translation or when social or political theory submits to a critique that is identified with an overall Wissenschaft, an overall science of knowing. If one follows the claims so very current today that all social and political theory is provisional, does the claim go all the way up or all the way down? When one claims the P and Q of all theory, is the claim the same as when the P's and Q's are applied to theories in the plural? If all political theories are provisional, does this mean that all, the all of all theory is provisional? Does the the claim of provisionality of all theory risk paradox or redundancy when it is claimed that the, as when it's claimed that all is relative? Or is the point to retain in the mind an all of the absolute that is not provisional precisely to keep critique ongoing in its assessment of all that is and must be provisional or qualified? 
that's a dense set of questions, particularly playful, um, to point out the confusion of terms. My investigation draws from my new book on the emancipation theses that have declared all sorts of modernist ends to art, religion, history, and philosophy. There I bring, brought together two proverbial lines from Hegel's prefaces to his phenomenology and philosophy of right. One line regarded the cows that recede into the blackness of non-appearance at night, while the other tracked the flight of the owl of Minerva, beginning with the gathering of the graying clouds. I pursued the contrast of black and gray as part of a color theory that inspired Goethe to let Mephistopheles declare that all theory, dear friends, is gray, contra the tree of life with its green and gold. Yet by use of the word and, Goethe's more subtle point was to bring theory and life back together und grün des Leben goldener Baum. If that is, the all of the absolute could be released from its overall monotonous gray. Just prior to calling up Minerva's owl, Hegel envisaged a philosopher as the child of his time, but with a timing such that philosophy comes to its knowing only in the gray of its maturity, hence only late and hence too late to issue instructions as to how the world ought to be. As the thought of the world, Hegel wrote, philosophy appears only or first, erst, as a time when the Wirklichkeit has gone through and completed its Bildungsprozess, when the maturity has been attained so that the ideal appears opposite the real, and by grasping its substance, rebuilds the shape or form in its intellectual realm. The appearing opposite suggested a difference in difference maintained in any real rebuilding, and with this, in any final absolute claim of identity. Hegel had already doubled up his use of the term of instruction to say of philosophy's perspective on, on the state that the Belehrung is not of instruction to Belehren, but much more how das sittliche Universum comes to be recognized, account werden soll, not just recognized, but recognized as though a second time. Thinking through philosophy's palette of greys to reproduce the shape of life in the intellectual realm, I investigated why Hegel had drawn the technique of monochromatic painting in gra Grau in Grau from art's history. Given the doubled up grey, did the age of philosophy's world picture anticipate a new form of life by laying down an architectural foundation or by drawing lines in the ground, these Grundlinien, for the title of the philosophy of right? If so, how little or much could a philosopher say about what, what uh, sorry, say about what from the Zitlico universum of the old life was carried forward into the new life without contradicting the prohibition on prescription? Then there was always the more extreme thought from Adorno that the ending at the, uh, ending at the modernist moment stood also for a cold death, voided of all possibility for any life to be renewed. Lifelong, Hegel charged others with taking a one-sided standpoint as regards all the dialectical binaries regarding the abstract and concrete universal in particular, the one and the many. One-sidedness stopped the logic of the dialectic in its tracks, leaving a stasis that he associated with a coldness and irony. Irony didn't have to be cold, but it became cold when any standpoint of thought rigidly or frigidly killed off its contrary, its opposition, its other. Uh, uh, Hegel articulated the terms of the mediation between identity and difference, the ideal and the real, which, while releasing the absolute knowing or self-consciousness from a history of servitude, still left the achieved idea of freedom awaiting its actualization in the social practice as a daily practice. Why did Hegel refuse the idea of freedom a prescriptive or instructional role? 
Was it to avoid overstepping the limits of philosophy? A way to separate for philosophy from a local social or political theory? Was there then, uh, what then was a philosophy of right? Was it a philosophy of, all, philosophy of all possible or local theories of right or rights? This is my question for today. Now, minding my own P's and Q's, which is always a good thing to do, I propose that for Hegel, the philosophy of right is refused its standpoint to instruct as a political theory instructs, so that granted its task of critique, it assumes a standpoint that must be neither provisional nor qualified. In pragmatist and critical theory, we read a lot about a hesitant openness in the philosopher's waiting room that allows reflection to follow upon participation, while yet the participation cannot do, do also without the reflection. But there are very different levels of reflection. As critique, philosophy assesses and tests the reasoning and justification of ideas, principles, and beliefs, which on the local grounds of everyday practice shape, um, shape through a local reasoning the intentions and beliefs that lead persons to do, to act, and to make things. Now, a brief ex etymological excursus tells us that the words provisionality and qualification have spread with negative and positive connotations. In the Hegelian dialectic, they have moved often positively as negations of a false positivity or to counter a civil right historically provisioned by the proviso that only certain persons of specific age, gender or race are included. The First Amendment provisions but also qualifies the freedom to speak for good and bad reasons, and the reasons may change given new views and situations. And so too for every law and right, um, so too for every right or law, for those at least to unpack the provisionality and qualification in terms of what must be constantly tested, revised, given a character that is taken to be hypothetical, conjectural, temporary, tentative, uncertain, non-guaranteed, or incomplete. All these terms of P's and Q's are offered as a counterweight in a society regarded as closed-minded regarding, say, the US Constitution, a counterweight to what we call the originalists, who see the meanings of rights and laws, as many people see artworks, as not subject to the sort of interpretation that can and has to adapt or alter over time. But what limits, if any, are then pro proposed on the provision of changing provisionality and qualifications? Another association of terms that touches provisionality to first proposals, to improvisations, intuitions, spontaneities, as we heard this morning, sketches, anticipations, first stabs or trials, or to beginnings call then for the difficult mental labor toward good ends. In German, we have as many terms for provisionality and qualification as we do in English, all kinds of terms, and I list them in the, the essay. And interestingly enough, where Hegel uses some of the terms, often in translation, we'll be, find one term being translated in, according to many different English terms, or vice versa, one English term being solidified, um, where in fact Hegel or, and German interpreters are using different terms. So what I do in my essay is try to make sure this translation and transmission between German and English terms for our P's and Q's gets checked out. I think that's an important task. Um, 
Hegel, as we know, narrated a world history about the rise and fall of societies, about the errors of consciousness and conscience that led minds astray. He wrote from the standpoint where such errors could be described as such, even if they were not known to be errors in the times when they ruled the roost. The cunning of reason works through the history from the beginning as a drive toward the sort of knowing made explicit as philosophy only at the end. Yet at the end, the knowing of philosophy could become far distanced from all the local theories of social organization if the truth now formalized by philosophy became what um, Hegel calls an empty nothing, nichtigus, or a um, dead positive, thought positive. To stop that emptiness, Hegel insisted that the non-provisionality of a non-qualification of the absolute standpoint that corresponded to philosophy's knowing had to retain its engagement with the provisionality and qualification of all political and social theories that were at work in the practice in the everyday. Now, that is basically my main claim here as to how philosophy from a non-provisional and non-qualified perspective performs a critique of the provisionality and qualification of all the theories that are operative on the ground. I think that uh, Pinkard in his sociolo Sociality of Reason, when he addresses this as a third possibility at the end of his text, text gets this quite right, but also I think maybe perhaps doesn't stress how far Hegel is in insisting on the, um, the, the role of philosophy as performing the critique. Pinkard works beautifully, I think, through the ways in which local theories on the ground as daily practice have to be both provisional and um, uh, qualified in their temporary resolutions, how that fits with a sense of a modernity that um, that acknowledges for the first time or first explicit time that daily practice won't live up to the ideals of freedom. We know that in the French, from the French Revolution and so on. Um, and Pinkard works through this so that he can say that when we're engaged in the daily practice, we operate with a provisionality and qualification of the local theory. It's the sense of it's being local. While we're operating with that local theory, we suspend our questioning of it, although we are constantly testing it according to the constant reasoning in which we engage as moral persons or persons engaged in social life. But yet, though uh, Pinkard um, describes that absolutely well, that I think that he misses out the dialectical leap that Hegel adds to this account and insists on in this account that the local theory that and the provisionality and qualification that attends our P's and Q's in the local practice cannot um, perform as it were all its um, uh, all its reasoning, all its contestation, that ha there has to be, and this is the philosopher's task of critique, not to be engaged in the practice, but to be reflecting upon that practice, to be as was taking a step out of the river, to use a nice Heraclitan thought, to um, see what it means for people to be wading in the river as part of their daily practice. And that insistence, I think, is um, spelled out very well. I, I think Pinkard is entirely aware of this, though I think that in um, posing his third resolution as um, it the, at the end, the absolute has to be provisioned and qualified, 
he doesn't address the negation of that, which is a standpoint that has to be non-provisional and non-qualified, which is a commitment somehow to the idea of reason, or the, uh, and um, with that, the idea of reason's freedom. Um, Neuhauser, or Neuhauser, um, I never know what to say of Fred, but uh, however we uh, address Fred, Fred um, says that um, uh, of Hegel's Sittlichkeit as a realm of actualized freedom, uh, that freedom is independent, necessary, and self-sufficient, but nevertheless must engage its determinacy since, I'm quoting, spirit's freedom is an independence from the other that is achieved not outside the other, but in or through the other. The being, um, the independence being mediated by the other means that the independence cannot turn to an empty formality which Hegel critiques throughout his writings, as far as I can tell, but rather the um, independence, what becomes what after Marx becomes known as a relative autonomy, that it's mediated through the conditions on the ground. And so in order for all local theory to be provisional and qualified, there has to be a standpoint which would not be a standpoint actually, because it would be no standpoint at all, but it would be an ultimate um, perspective from which there would be no provisionality or qualification engaged. The critique would have to engage reason as independent and free, yet as mediated. That dialectical relation allows the negation of our P's and Q's of local theory to temper the claims that everything is provisional and qualified. It's, we have the same kind of paradox when we say everything is relative, that that claim itself can't be, and everything then turns on how we assess the right kinds of relativism. So I, um, Hegel, um, I worked through this essay to show how Hegel sustains this dialectical moment of non-provisionality and non-qualification by going back to some of his early essays, especially this brilliant essay of 1802 on the scientific ways of treating natural law. And there, interestingly, he insists um, on the way in which philosophy as a mode of critique, once it's achieved, this consciousness of the idea of freedom as a mode of critique um, can never promote itself to an ideological standpoint where it finds identity with a single local theory that is working on the ground. That ideological promotion later worked out by Marx in the German ideology doesn't allow for there to be an identity between the idea of freedom and a local theory. And Hegel writes about the university, and Pinkard writes beautifully about this as well, um, the way in which the philosophy compromises its mode of critique precisely when it starts to equate the idea of freedom with um, actualizations or lo local expressions of freedom that are operative within other disciplines or departments, um, say in the sciences or in, or in the arts or in the politics and so on. And you see that compromise as a reduction of philosophy's capability to actually critique um, what must almost always be critiqued, namely that a local theory can never contain all the possibility that is captured in what a political theory should do. So you have a really, in a way, a radical critique of the current state of academia, which is what uh, Pinkard also writes about at the very end of his book. Um, one thing I do in this essay is work through an enormous um, number of claims about P's and Q's in contemporary 
Hegel scholarship, I pretty much got everybody um, there from Brandon to Pippin to Molly Farnes and Desmond and Harrison Messina, Moya, the whole caboodle. I looked up every use of their term provisional and the, uh, provisionality, which is the hot topic at the moment in Kantian political theory. Um, I looked at Adorno's um, treatment of Heidegger's letter, which is a, uses Hegel to talk about provisionality. Um, but all the time, what I wanted to do was just offer one extra claim to the way that this claim of provisionality is currently being worked out. That when we say that all theory is provisional and qualified, we must not thereby think that the all of the theory that claim to reach an idea of freedom is ever exhausted by a single theory. But the non-exhaustion is what precisely opens the space for the critique that's performed by philosophy as independent from those local theories. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and now we are happy to take questions. Dean, it looks like you were first up there. Those are actually clapping hands, so I'm, I, I could certainly ask something, but I'm... Oh, I did. Go ahead, Dean. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I just have some general questions and um, about the kind of where you see this provisionality and qualification relating to like maybe some other ways that that people have engaged with Hegel's logic. I mean, I sort of sort of I wonder if it if if you just have anything to say about this question about, for example, the necessity of contingency. I mean, so much of the provisionality and qualification um, discussion seems to be a way of kind of circling around the problem of contingency. Um, and that would, um, but as you say, it has to be situated somewhere. It, it's like you can't just say everything is subject to contingency without that itself being a certain sort of philosophical claim that situates it somehow. Um, I'm not sure exactly what kind of question this is, what just sort of more of a, like an elaboration to try to relate your set of topics to, to these other ones. I mean, I, I, there's ways in which I think maybe it could be tied into the issue of choice and history. I, I just happen to have been just teaching the Schelling system of transcendental idealism. And there's this great line, right? He says, choice is the goddess of history. And it made me think, well, that's an interesting claim that has something to do with these questions of where what needs to be open for history to keep going and how it relates to choice considered as arbitrary or contingent or outside of a domain of necessity that then has to get reincorporated in it. So I'm not sure that's exactly a question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on those. Um, well, um, I do discuss uh, contingency at the end of the essay, um, uh, where um, in, also in relation to provisionality and in relation to relativism, which are all these difficult terms. Adorno points out in his lectures um, on ontology um, and so on in various places that philosophy makes certain concepts a problem um, for us. It, it's suspicious of contingency, it's suspicious of relativism, um, it's suspicious of notions of provisionality. And so when people nowadays are saying everything is provisional or they're stressing the provisionality, often it's as a counterweight to a claim of philosophy always to be treating only the necessity, only the essential and the like. But Adorno points out that it's if you take this notion of critique, and I think Hegel has it 
um, long before Adorno criticizes him for having done away with it. I think Adorno is wrong there. But I think um, uh, Hegel insists on this, that um, uh, qualification and contingency no longer become dirty words in the way that history and even art no longer become kind of dirty words that somehow philosophy can help us get over. That um, in a completely um, mediated view, philosophy is constantly assessing and contesting the terms that are laid down by these um, on the ground, by the arts, by history, by the sciences, and keeping this mediation of what's going on in the ground, the necessity and the essential, it is much more Aristotelian in the sense that it, it um, takes from the contingency and the, um, the, uh, the what is relative or what is local, what is worth keeping. And I think that uh, Pinkard captures that, if I may. I mean, I'm sure Terry is wanting to scream at me, but anyway, the, uh, but I think he captures that in the sense of um, always stressing this ongoing daily labor in the practice, this daily labor of reason. But it's no longer, of course, a pure reason or worked out at the heights of some kind of pure logic. We heard the idea of pure choice or pure will this morning, but it is mediated on the ground. And yet I think Hegel insists that there's still an additional task of philosophy or as critique that has to separate itself, as I said, take a step out of the river to assess what's worth keeping. Uh, Perry says that you can't question everything in the daily engagement of the practice. You have to make, allow things to take on a provisional sense. We can't go to the voting box and start questioning the whole foundation for voting, though we try hard to do that in America. We can't do that, but th things have to make sense for the practice to keep on going. It doesn't mean that we're not contesting it on the ground, but there's an additional level of contestation. And I was trying to pull out this additional level um, so that philosophy doesn't lose its task in Hegelian terms. I, I hope that helps. It's more repetitive, but I'm going to keep repeating myself because I don't know any more than I've said. Thank you.